Welcome to the Jacks Rangers Show, a New England Free Jacks fan podcast. And now, Rangers, here's your host, Phil Harris. Huzzah, Rangers. This is Phil Harris up here at the Granite Outpost in beautiful Manchester, New Hampshire. You know what this is. This is episode 14 of the Jacks Rangers show. Got a jam-packed episode. We will have two guests on, special guests. Also in the Outriders segment, we're going to have all of the Outriders this season. So obviously, Dave and myself will be participating. But we had also two guests, Outriders, in the form of Ted Black and Chris Lind, both great friends of the show. We will have them on the Outriders segment as well as we sum up the MLR season for the Free Jacks right now here on the Jacks Ranger show. Kick that mule. Let's hear the theme music one last time for 2021. Woo! All right, Rangers, that is the last time you will hear that theme music in 2021, but don't be too sad. We will be back in 2022 better than ever with the Jacks Rangers show. We will be starting a brand new season in 2022 for the upcoming MLR 2022 season. So just wanted to mention a couple shout outs. Anybody that has participated in the Jacks Rangers show in 2021, big shout out to you. Any interviews that we've had, anybody that's helped out with content whatsoever, anybody that's, you know, said hello to me at games and said they listen to the show, anybody that's, you know, messaged us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of those things, shouting us out, anybody that gave us a follow or a like on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those social media platforms, shout out to you guys, all the Rangers out there. Without you, this would really not be possible. If there wasn't any fan interaction, this show would not have continued, you know, so on to bigger and better things in 2020 two for the Jacks Ranger show. But in the meantime, we've got episode 14. We're calling this one silly season. So we're going to put our, you know, in other sports it's called general manager. I believe in MLR, we're going with performance director, at least for the free Jacks, that role composing the roster. So we'll be looking into that in the Outrider segment. Two very special guests in this episode. The first one is Dylan Ferraci. He is a recently graduated rugby player. He graduated from New England College up in Henniker, New Hampshire, in my neck of the woods. So he was actually on episode three way back when in 2021 here with us at the Jacks Ranger show. He, so he's an original gangster in terms of uh, Rangers out there. He is also a moderator for a lot of the rugby supporters groups that you see out there, including the Free Jack supporters group on Facebook. So we talked with, we sat down with Dylan. He was actually at, actually, so we we did a recording with Dylan. He was actually at a Philadelphia Phillies game supporting the New York Mets, which is pretty cool that you can actually do that and have a, a Zoom meeting at a ballpark. So that was pretty interesting. So we had a 10 minute conversation just about him declaring for the draft and all that sort of stuff. So without further ado, we'll jump right into the uh, interview with with Dylan Ferraci, right here on the Jacks Rangers show. Woo! Huzzah, Rangers! This is Phil Harris again here at the Jacks Rangers show. I've got Dylan for uh, Ferraris or Ferraci, excuse me. Um, he is actually at uh, the Philadelphia Phillies game right now, supporting the Mets. So this is uh, the first time this has ever happened. But uh, yeah. Um, Dylan, tell us, you know, for people that did not catch the interview earlier this year, plug your social media and give us a brief rundown of where you're from and how you found rugby. All right. So I, my social media is at Dylan Ferracci Rugby on Instagram, Facebook, D Ferracci Rugby on Twitter. Follow me there. Um, or you can follow my YouTube channel, Dylan Ferracci. Watch my highlights. Um, I'm from Connecticut. Originally went to school in New Hampshire. Um, I found rugby at, in high school my freshman year when I was cut from the baseball team. As Phil said, I'm at a baseball game right now, ready for the Mets. Um, but I was able to go to college, play D1 rugby for two years, and continue at that school for the last two years. And I've had the opportunity to play for the Hartford Arpooners, Hartford Wanderers, and a few other clubs around the country, which has been amazing. Awesome. So this is our MLR draft episode that we're having here. So tell us what you would bring to an MLR team if you were to be drafted by whatever team drafts you. 
So I'm a scrum half, but um, I'm very dedicated to the game. I've become more uh, rugby smart, if you want to say it like that, since I've been to college. Um, I'm kind of a double threat. I'm not just being a player. I'm also I'm looking for a job. Um, anything in social media or anything back office, that's what I want to do because I know I'm not going to be able to play forever. I, would love, I want to play as high, as high level rugby as I can for as long as I can. If once that time, once my body says it's over, I got to hang up the boots when, it's, when my body says to and then uh, help grow the game. That's one thing I'm very passionate about is growing the game of rugby here in the United States and North America. It's kind of what, what I have my job doing right now with Puerto Rico Rugby League is being their graphic designer. Mm -hmm. So it's been great. Can you uh, quickly describe your also your social media skills as well and your experience with that? Okay, cool. Um, uh, I, was just, I just wrapped up an internship with the youth lacrosse talk club um, a few weeks ago from this past summer, um, two-way lacrosse. Um, I, through that, I've been able to use a new service called Canva, and that's been amazing. Um, I, I first started off using Google Slides, um, just taking off PNGs uh, off the internet and just customizing it through that, using it in Photoshop. But then I've been able to use Canva, and I've been learning more and more. I've been using, uh, I've been running social media accounts since my junior year of college, uh, running my school's my school teams, um, New England College um, men's rugby account, and then I got a job offer with the Hartford Arpooters um, from Marcus Atabu, and I've been doing it ever since. It's been amazing. Awesome. So yeah, I mean it's a it's, it's a double threat situation, obviously with Dylan. Um, not only can he play rugby, he can also, uh, you know, control the social media accounts or do whatever you need him to do, make a graphic. So he's a double threat for sure. So, um, Dylan, in three words, can you describe how you play rugby? What is your style of rugby? So when I first came into college, my coach described me as a, as a scrum half who liked to run with the ball, um, like a forward. Um, but now that I've been playing a little more sevens, I've been trying to deal that ball out more. But as a scrum half, of course, my job is to deal that ball out. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I just try to get just straight up nose toward rugby. That's, that's, my, that's my game. Just play rugby. All right. Uh, what have you been doing to stay fit and sharp doing the, during these pandemic times? So, fortunately, I've been able to play the last few months since last time we talked, which has been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I played 115s match with the new London County Whalers. Um, against Connecticut Gray, and then I've been playing some sevens matches um, with, uh, who was it, with Hartford Wanderers, New York Raiders, and this past, last one was with the Monadnock uh, Wolfpack out of New Hampshire. Okay, right on. The 603. Yeah, exactly. Um, so three and tomorrow, I'm going to be in, Phil I'm currently in Philadelphia, and tomorrow is the, uh, the day we're recording this, the Philadelphia 10s. I'll be play playing with Queens Rugby Club, repping New York Mets. Let's go. All right, cool. Um, what are you looking to develop with your game after being drafted? What do you feel like you need to polish with your game? Um, just becoming more of a diverse scrum half. Um, and then I'm always open to learn about the game, um, especially if there's a very well-experienced scrum half and ahead of me. Um, I'm fully I, I'm will, will willingly learn from him, um, and, and especially if he's very experienced scrum half. And I'll learn from anyone just to di for diversify my game. I, I, I'm not just a scrum. I'll play anywhere, really, but scrum has my priority position. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I'll just, I'm always willing to learn from anyone. Perfect. If you're drafted, what will you do to celebrate? One more time. Uh, if you get drafted, what are you going to do to celebrate? Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know, actually. If, I, I'll probably just sit there shocked um, <laughs> to figure out if you're drafting something. There's how many guys right now in, on the website? 110? Uh, yeah, there's prospects. a lot. There's, there's a only lot. 49 slots, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So um, if I'm picked, um, I will think – I'll probably pray and just celebrate with whoever I am with at the time. Yeah. Um, whoever I'm watching it with. Like, um. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I'll just be there in shock, to be honest. I'm, I'll be extremely thankful. 
Yeah, exactly. Okay. So one word association, you've played this before on the show in the previous interview. So I'm going to say one word or a couple of words and you give me one word in response. Okay. Sounds good. Would G. One more time. Would G. Sasquatch. <laughs> All right. MLR. Or Jack Swatch. Yes. There you go. MLR draft. Promise land. All right. So this one's a little tricky. It's a more of a curveball for you, okay? Ten okay. wins, three losses. Is that the Free Jacks record? It is not. It's actually the record of um, the Red Sox against the Yankees this year. <laughs> uh, I'm at a bet game. We don't talk about that. <laughs> all right, all right. Commissioner George Killebrew. A bright light. Okay. Final one here. And this is the last one. And just for my selfish reasons here, Jack's Rangers. The best free Jack podcast in the world. The only one. So, yeah, we are the best. <laughs> That's why I said free Jack. I didn't say rugby. I yeah, I got you. A lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. Some might say too many, but, you know, I, I would never say that. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, Dylan, I appreciate your time. Uh, guys, he's a friend of the show. So if any, um, what would he call this? Uh, Emma, any MLR team personnel out there that would be watching this video, check out Dylan's highlights on the internet. Um, give him a shot. He's a great kid and he can play some rugby and he could also make some graphics for you. So yeah, hopefully we'll get him. We'll, we'll watch him. Get I have a, um, just before we end it, I have one more video coming out soon. Um, once this last tournament's over, I'll be posting that in a few weeks, hopefully. So cool. So everybody keep your eyes peeled. Rangers out there, keep your eyes peeled to the draft night on August the 19th, I believe it is. And hopefully we'll see our boy Dylan, who is a Ranger, uh, one of the first ones, get drafted. Thanks, guys. I appreciate Thank you. It. Have a good one, man. All right, Rangers. Tell us how you thought the interview went with Dylan Faraci, this young scrum half who has declared for the MLR draft. Pretty interesting that we were able to record that at a ballpark. You know, that's a, that's a first for me, man. Uh, very cool. Yeah, excited for Dylan's future, however it may go down. He's a talented kid for sure. And for the hardcore Rangers out there, you normally see the format of this show going where we'll have outriders and then interviews afterward. But I kind of wanted to mix it up here for the last episode. Tell us how you like the new format here that I'm trying out before the end of the season one, if you will, here on the podcast. So with this being a two-guest episode, we're doing a, a guest and then outriders and then another guest. Send us an email at Jack's Ranger Show at gmail.com or comment on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, however you reach out to us and however you see the content, let us know. And also tell a friend about the podcast. I have never mentioned this on the podcast, but you know, if you have a rugby fan out there that's uh, interested in MLR, specifically in the New England area that may support the Free Jacks, let them know that this podcast exists. People can still go back. I mean, obviously the Outrider segments are not going to be too relevant in the off season here because we were specifically talking about the previous game and the upcoming game, but go back and, you know, listen or or if you haven't seen some of the videos, recommend the video interviews that I've done throughout the season because some of them aren't specific to that, you know, that week of, of whenever it was. You know, we had mags on. We had world famous Dallin Stanford, the voice of the Free Jacks, the best rugby commentator in the whole world. Josh Larson captain of the Free Jacks, Canadian International. Unfortunately, Josh, I found out that Josh is going to my college rugby rival, the biggest one in Clemsucks University. They're in uh, the middle of nowhere in South Carolina in Pickens County. <laughs> I was joking around with Josh that, you know, I hope he's very successful in his coaching gig there, but I hope they, I hope they lose that game against my Carolina Gamecocks. Yeah. Uh, up next, we've got the Outrider segment. So the way that I wanted to do this this week is, you know, have on all of the Outriders that have joined us in season one. Of course, myself and Dave, who've been there for pretty much the entire time of the Outriders. But we had a special guest in Ted Black, who is the president of Cape Cod Rugby. And also uh, Chris Lind, who is a big rugby fanatic, a very nice guy. He actually lives in here in the Granite Outpost like myself. He's been a friend of the show. He's given us great feedback throughout the episodes. So we had him join in. So yeah, without further ado, here is the very last Outriders segment of 2021 here on the Jacks Rangers show. Woo! 
Huzzah Rangers, this is Phil Harris again here at the Jax Rangers show. This is episode 14, Silly Season. This is the Outriders segment, of course. We've got Dave, as always, but we brought in Chris as well, a previous Outrider in the season. So let's get started, boys. How y'all doing? Doing very well. How about you, Phil? Not bad, not bad. How about you, Chris? I am living. I'm home from Pennsylvania. It feels good to be back in the Shire. Nice, nice shirt, man. I know, I love it. AC Slater, triple threat. (laughs) Absolutely, okay. So just wanted to summarize the season in basically two sentences here. The New England Free Jacks finished the season with a record of 10 wins and six losses, six losses, which was good enough for fourth out of sixth in the Eastern Conference with 48 total points. Um, So first question here, and we'll do like a round robin here. Um, What was the main positive and negative um, for this first full season with the Jacks? And my cat just jumped up into my lap. So um, I'll go first if you don't mind. I think Morty wants to speak here, but um, yeah, I don't think she knows much about rugby. So the first positive here that I wanted to mention is home wins. Almost undefeated at home, Fort Union Point and Fort Quincy are truly a fortress, and we want to make sure that uh, Fort Quincy stays that way. Biggest negative in my eyes is the away losses. Our away record was woeful, and um, that's why we didn't get into the playoffs ultimately. I mean, obviously, we lost at home to NOLA, and that was kind of like the nail in the coffin. But if you look back in the season, those away losses toward the beginning of the season – really sealed our fate with regards to the other teams were just good enough to um, kind of put some distance between us and them with us losing some of those games at the beginning of the season. So it's, we have to find a way in the next season to win more games on the road. Absolutely crucial, but I'll throw it to Dave here with your positive and negative. Yeah. I I hit pretty close to the same mark as you. Um, The way I frame that positive is just the team not giving up. Um, You know, they fought every second, of every match, uh, and especially at home. And I think that was a reflection and some of the guys, Mags and, and uh, Ryan Martin have talked about, they looked at what Boston expects out of a sport team and they wanted to deliver that. And the thing they zoned in on was toughness. And I think they you know, hit it in spades and that was a big positive. It was intentional. Um, they made a point of doing it and they did a great job. So I think that is their Uh, The best thing about this past season, the grit. Um, The low point for me was the loss in D.C. Um, It was one of those road losses that you mentioned that really ended up being very impactful. Um, The NOLA loss hurt, but you're going to get bad calls. That's just a thing that's outside of your control. Um, The D.C. match, they looked a little bit um, just not sure, not concrete on their game plan a lot of people weren't executing very well um and to me it was kind of the low point of the season performance wise for the team so i picked that as the as the low um and then we saw the rebound in that home stretch all right chris what you got for us my positive was i thought the team was very dangerous all year even in some of the losses the the road losses where we struggled um to kind of piggyback on that they still had flashes of brilliance in those games, a lot of fun tries. Um, and so I just thought that they were really fun to watch through and through, whether they were winning or losing. Uh, and it was obviously better win for us when they were winning. Uh, and then the negatives, you know, just those games that got away, like we were talking about, those early season games where they lost on the road. It's tough. They pretty much started completely on the road the first home game last week of March or first week of April. Can't remember. But that's a long time to go on the road, and it seemed like the team played into their own, found better combinations, stuff like that. Um, and it just took them a while to play into it, you know, and then they went 50-50 ball, and then you get that one-point loss like Dave had talked about where you just can't really control a bad call, and then it ends up having a greater impact maybe than it should have. And then, but you could still control your own destiny. But again, they went 50 50 in the East because I count the two wins against Toronto to negate the two losses to NOLA. And then they played 50 50 with everybody else. And so it's tough to make the playoffs with 50 50. But man, after that last match, I think that the playoffs should be expanded at another team. So maybe, so maybe I, if we expand the teams, that might be a, a situation for the future, like a wild card. That would be great. Yeah. Um, play in match between the two, you know, that'd be cool. conferences, top teams. I don't know. Something fun. I like the weird stuff. 
I got a message from Ted, our other guest outrider. It doesn't look like he's going to be able to make it. So hopefully Ted can watch this. We miss you, Ted. Um, where do we need depth on this team? This is, I, I put it as position specific because you can just say forwards or backs, but I really want to get more into the detail of it. Um, so I wrote down John Poland, uh, or excuse me, specifically the scrum half position, but I'm going to change my pick. I wrote all this down, but I'm just going to throw that out the window. I think most importantly, we need an eight man because with Conradi departing, I know that we can put people in there that can play that position, but we need somebody that match. I don't think we're going to match the performance of Conradi, but we need somebody that's really up there. So that's a position of uh, where we need to strengthen. In my opinion, what do you guys think? Uh, Chris, we'll go to you first. Yeah. So I think that I subscribe, I'm a subscriber that you got to play strong right up the middle of the field. So two to nine to 10 to 15, but specifically I think that we need depth at 10 and 15. Um, I know that we had a specialist 10 with Harrison Boyle and then it switched over to Waka and he played outstanding and they kept that there. Uh, but there was a lot of shuffling at fullback. And just when you have that inconsistency right up the middle of the field, I thought we showed great flexibility and you could call that depth, but I would like to see uh, more specialists there because imagine if we had that really strong 15 and Dougie Fife was outstanding all over the pitch, but I liked him far better in the centers. I thought he was more effective at outside center for the team than he was at 15. And we just kind of put him at 15 because we don't have a good 15 because we'll move to 10. So, I mean, so I guess I'm cheesing out and saying backs, but specifically 10 and 15 is where all I right. would say we need more people. <laughs> I agree. Um, Dave, what about yeah. you? Uh, I think it's hard to say. I think it's I think it's really hard to say. I think um, you both have really good points. We definitely needed backline depth through the season, and I, I but I think that was maybe a little bit an artifact of situations with some of the players from the the Jackals draft um, and just the various complications because we saw a lot of talented backline players coming in in like the last third of the season. Right. Um, so I think the team was trying to address that specifically. Um, so to me, where you need depth next is probably the front row, but we've already got a few people who are what I would say are development players, right? Spence Kruger and Quentin Newcomer are apprenticing sort of under Seth and Eric. Um, and at Hooker, we're in a pretty good position with Peter Janssen and then Kotsia covering. So what I think, um, I think the most correct answer is probably Phil's eight man pick. But what I said I would like to see is maybe draft another um, young uh, jumping threat of a lock, a line out player, somebody who's really going to dial that in um, and apprentice a little bit under Josh Larson, who I think he's probably going to be around next year. I, I think we, we can expect, but beyond that you know who knows and kind of getting the next class of jumping locks ready um while you still have him as a mentor player around and just real quick the reason i selected scrum half is you know john poland is excellent and we assume that he will be the starter next year but beyond that it's like it's a little frightening i mean i don't want to disrespect ollie or, or the rest of those guys but i mean you really need a solid backup that can consistently come in you know each game um, after, let's say, 65 minutes or something like that and do a good enough job to where you don't even notice that John Poland is missing. Um, so, yeah, we I think to not have to to not have to have that happen to us. I, I agree, Phil. We were, we were really lucky that we weren't put in a situation where we were forced into that. Uh, John, yeah, John I, Poland, Iron Man. Yeah. Sean, yeah, Sean Yacobian and Tom Brasati, I think, were juggling some injuries over the course of the season. Right. I think both of them were out at different times. And that is really going to, you know, when, when you're two backup scrum halves who normally would be kind of battling it out for that last 20 minutes position are getting hurt, you don't really have a choice. It's not a battle anymore. It's whoever's healthy. Right. And you, if you have one already out, it's tough to, you know, bring in. Jacobian or Brasati, which they did a little bit. Brasati in particular got some some like 10, 15 minute looks toward the end of the season. But yeah, we we kind of walked the tightrope on that one. And we were lucky that a player as skilled as JP was able to put in as many minutes as he did. Yes, sir. Okay, so as a fan, guys, what is your moment of the season? 
what I have here is it has um, it has to be that final try scored by Samu Samu Vodre to put an exclamation point on the win against the Dirt Peckers of New Jersey. The battle-hardened crowd that saw that game walked out to down to the edge of the stands for the last, let's say, 10 minutes or so. Um, so we were extremely loud. I'm sure the players could feel our intensity there. Um, the people that stayed there were like the real hardcore Ranger-type folks uh, that didn't care about the weather. They were just there to have a good time and it really cheer on our free jacks. So what happened was when that score, try was scored, Ross Pallon, Marcelo, and myself, which are, you know, Rangers through and through, embraced and jumped up and down in a circle. So that's one of my favorite, um, you know, sporting moments of all time, just that memory. Um, I don't think I'll ever forget that. And I've been to a lot of sporting events in my time. It just felt so – to win against the Dirt Peckers at home in those conditions, it really felt like there was a galvanizing moment between the fan base, and that try just sent it over the top. So I'll go to you, Dave. What do you, what do you got? Um. Yeah, that was a that was a great moment. I almost picked that uh, that match because it was it was pretty special and a lot of fun. But I went with the first home match against Utah. Uh, I got there really early, and uh, I just got in as soon as I could and spent a lot of time just kind of walking around the grounds and taking it all in. Um, I was super excited. Uh, I remember bumping into Mags. I had the huzzah sign and he was actually like the first autograph I got because oh, I saw him and I was like, oh, hey, hey, Mags, like, can you sign this? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, you know what he's like. He's such a yeah. fun guy. He, he loved it. He's like, yeah, great to have you. Thanks for coming. You know, thanked me for being there. He did had no idea who I was, you know, <laughs> um, and it was just so cool. It was something that I'd been looking forward to for years and years. So for me, that, that Utah match. And then they delivered a really great, you know, one point win uh, for the home crowd that really set the tone for the rest of the season. Chris, what you got? I really liked uh, the first match uh, against Toronto at home. Um, I think it was a key point in the season for both teams. I think we were pretty much both playing 500 ball at that point. And Toronto was an early dark horse for the East. I think that they probably had the most unfulfilled potential of the season the biggest bummer and plus i mean tough go having to play down there in atlanta yep. away from home but i don't know i just thought it was a very exciting end of the match i thought it was it was another one of those cold rainy tough matches and that kind of you're three and oh at home and then there was that spark and it was like and that's when the fourth union point uh started i can't remember exactly i think it was after that show uh you yep. guys that's when it was like maybe dubbed for Union Point. Maybe it was the one before that. I'm not sure, but that's that's what got me really excited. It was my first game in person, so kind of going along the road to Dave. Like for me personally, <laughs> yeah. that was like that that match. I, I had a lot of fun at that match. Yeah, for sure. That was a great time. All right, so um, Dave and I picked uh, some dream sponsors, some dream kit sponsors. On uh, so we picked this in the last episode. We posted them on social media to rave reviews. I'm going to ask uh, Chris, I'm also going to get, you know, get with Ted later on and figure out what is his dream kit sponsor, and I will make these up and post them online. But Chris, um, for a New England company that would be perfect on the kit, just right there in front, what do you, what do you say? Got to go with Sam Adams. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's so like American rugby too. Like how many, like, uh, I just think of all of uh, the, the Wolfhounds had Tullamore Dew for a long time. Mystic River was... Uh, I think it's Coors Light now, but it used to be Miller Light. You know, just having some sort of like beer and or whiskey on the front of your kit is like very New England. Um, and then who better if we're going to have a beer than, than Sam Adams? People don't want to see Budweiser or Miller Light out there. It doesn't, I mean, they probably pay the big bucks for the Free Jacks to get on there more money than say Sam Adams, but Sam Adams is a revolutionary Free Jacks. It just rolls. I think it fits. I think they need to talk to them. Get on the phone, Mags. Get them on the <laughs> get them on the line. Get them on the kit. I like with no disrespect. To, I can't even remember. See, that's the thing. I don't even know who the actual sponsor is right now. It's Alloy but, Therapeutics, uh, I believe, is the main. Yes, yeah, so no disrespect sponsor. to Alloy Therapeutics, but let's so, go, Sam Adams. What's interesting about that is that's also the owner's other company. He's he's a biotech guy, so it's just like I wonder if they were trying to get a kit sponsor and it didn't work. So they you know they went to Eric and with their hands held out like, please help us. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I want to see some really cool companies eventually down the road, and that's going to bring in more revenue, right? Um, so, yeah, I think 
I think Sam Adams is the perfect, perfect idea. I mean, it's up there with Dunkin' Donuts and, and Boston Dynamics. Dine- Boston Dynamics is a great idea, too, with the, the robots and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, Sam Adams is great. I actually heard uh, recently that they're going to partner up with Pepsi, uh, PepsiCo to make alcoholic uh, Mountain Dew. So look for that next year. Yeah. Dangerous. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> Lucky consumers. Call of Duty players around the world are rejoicing right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chris, do you have any ideas about what you would like the kit to look like next year? You want to just go with the classic look or? Yeah, I'm pretty lame on this one. I thought that they did, as far as opinions go, I thought they did an outstanding job. I liked our look. I thought, you know, even with um, other red, white, and blue teams, like, you know, because DC had that solid uniform with the with the sponsor or whatever, yep. it differentiated us with the hoops. I thought, I just really liked that. And then, I don't know, though, you get creative. I think we could get some pretty cool alternate kits. I would like to see an alternate kit. I think like an all green kind of kit or something like that. Uh, Mags, former head coach of Dartmouth, Dartmouth yep. New England. <laughs> uh, a lot of green uniforms, I think, in the Revolution. Queens Rangers under Rogers, I think, wore green in a mix. So not a big historian guy. Fact check me on that one. Somebody's got to, but uh, I just think that that would be cool. But I, I'm pretty lame. I, I like, I like, I enjoyed the kits. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, yeah, let's let's they're, let's, they're um, really solid, and I think it's good to when something is good to name it. So I don't think it's a bad pick. I think it's good props to the the team who came up with this year's jerseys, and they did a great job. I'll tell I you who would be pissed about the kit sponsor though, uh, with uh, Chris's suggestion. It's Baxter Brewing Company. <laughs> 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 it would be upset. They'd have to, they'd have to step up. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Oof, I did not yeah. even think about that. Sorry, Baxter, no disrespect. Like your beers too. Right? <laughs> we're revolutionary. Sorry. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so moving right along here, guys, uh, who do you want to see on the Free Jacks roster that would be a marquee big name signing for next year? Let's try to keep it somewhat realistic. So Dan Carter, I believe, is in retirement happily, and uh, he would cost a million dollars a year. So that's not going to happen. Uh, in terms of my pick, I actually put two on here. Uh, keep in mind, they're both from the same team, though. Harlequins are the champions of England, and two of their most recognizable players are former England internationals. Danny Kerr, scrum half, 34 years old, and Joe Marler, prop, 31 years old, are getting older in age. Uh, now, they would, this would be a perfect time to wave goodbye to Harlequins and say hello to our Jacks. I think Danny Kerr is the more realistic of the two, but would he split time with Johnny Poland? I don't think so. Um, doubtful. Um, I really want Mahler because um, immediately he would put a lot of eyes on the Free Jacks. He is huge on social media. He has his own podcast. It's very popular, the Joe Mahler Show. I've, he is such a character. He would be amazing for the Free Jacks, not just on the field, because I'm sure he can still get it done at 31 as a prop in this league. But the eyes that he would bring internationally – would be unreal to MLR, uh, just like we've seen with other um, popular rugby players that have come over. Um, we'll go with Chris first. Who you got? You stole my pick with Marler. And <laughs> only because he's still, I mean, he's still such a good player. Yep. And, you know, maybe not internationally anymore, but for club. Uh, and that, and just what a personality. But had an alternate. He's fresh off his Lions series defeat. But what an incredible comeback. Alan Wynn Jones, the big oh, wow. man. You want a guy in the lineup? I mean, what? I mean, they they lost the Lions series, but and he still plays for Wales, has a ton of caps, but he's pretty old, and he could be one of those swan song. Mm-hmm. You know, he's played forever. Yeah. Uh, you know, and he could bring a lot of experience about professionalism. And honestly, I don't believe he would mind um, splitting time. Don't know the man personally, but when you're that far in age with injuries and everything else like that, if he takes a match or two off and provides, you know, and then he gets next to some of our young American players, like a Jackson Thieves or something like that. I just think it would be incredible for the league. I think it would be good for developing American players and other players, anybody, it doesn't really matter. Uh, So Alan Wynn Jones would be my pick. Perfect. That's a good one. We got Dave. Uh, I ratcheted it down a, a notch on the profile. Um, and, my pick was Richie Gray, uh, former lock for Scotland. He's been plying his trade yes. um, in France for a long time. The older of the Gray brothers, if you're not familiar, both Richie and Johnny Gray played lock for Scotland um, 
Uh, Johnny still gets caps. Richie hasn't played in, a, in several years, uh, in part because he went off to France to earn a little bit better living than he could make in right. uh, Scotland. Although he is coming back to Glasgow, if you're a Richie Cray fan, going to see him back at home uh, next season. Um, he is in the mold of the incredibly high tackle count lock. Uh, both of them have some of the highest tackle completion rates uh, in the leagues that they compete in. Um, just guys who, you know, if you get within 10 feet of them on the pitch, you're going down. There's, they're never missing. Mm -hmm. um, also line out jumper. And I think the right uh, place in their career where uh, they're getting, a, a, he's getting a little bit along in age and is going to probably start looking elsewhere. Um, and that short season in the MLR is really attractive to players in that position. And then I, I did have a backup, which is Blade Thompson, who's a lock and eight man for Scotland as well. He's a Kiwi um, and has played a good amount of super rugby. Um, and he's just a good, good utility player. So again, keeping it, keeping it uh, on the down low guys, guys who really might, um, you know, you could conceivably see, for sure. Tag him in the post. Maybe he'll uh, give us a listen. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, we, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> we should make Bring him in. Right. I'm gonna maybe make Doug Fife right. knows him. Yeah, Rich, yeah maybe oh, he does. Yeah, yeah. For sure. He does. One of the guys, one of the, my teammates at Charles River, a man named Grant McOslin, who's from Glasgow, played with, uh, I believe, Richie, the older of the, the Gray brothers, like in school. They were, you know, Scotland is only so big and they both grew up in the area and they were like perennial uh opponents he was like yeah he was uh he was pretty good he's a giant too i mean obviously locks are supposed to be like everybody's like oh phil no shit Every, locks are supposed to be tall but he's really really tall like super yeah he is six foot ten richie gray is <laughs> Jesus. he is a tremendously tall man can you imagine if we if we get the timing right? We're just stealing line outs left and right, and they're no, they're, right. there's no way that they're going to get them from us. You know what I'm saying? Like he would be a game changer for sure. No lifter, just jumps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so the last thing we got here before Dave's report card, the end of the season report card. There was a lot of fuss online about the MLR final between LA and Atlanta due to the lack of Americans on the pitch. Does this concern you? So what I have here is somewhat, I don't think it looks great for an American league to have so few American players in the championship game, but there's an argument that these young Americans can learn from some of these more skilled foreign players to become better and better in the years to come. So down the road, there would be more Americans playing potentially on the, in the final. Um, I will say this, I'm not too sure that being able to trade international spots is a good idea. That is how LA, I believe, stacked their roster they during the MLR draft or prior to it, they got a couple in, uh, international spots from other teams um, for their draft picks. So I think the league, the league might want to look at that and say, maybe we should, that's not exactly how we want to proceed. Maybe that should be banned. I mean, I'm all for free market, free market capitalism, but they have to have certain rules to keep the league competitive. And I think that's probably a bad idea. And I, and I have to say it's probably a bad trade from the teams that did that with LA they would probably want to take that back um, just to have more skilled players, internationals coming in. Um, so that, that's my two cents on it. Uh, Dave, we'll go with you first. Yeah. Um, I have kind of the opposite perspective because I land in the development camp. Um, it doesn't worry me uh, because I think that the best thing about MLR is guys, Americans apprenticing under, really seasoned players who are going to show them what it's like to compete at the highest level. Um, and that is not just experience of having been at a certain level, but the mindset you bring, the competitive uh, skills that you're teaching to your team, right? And Adam Ashley Cooper and Matt Gitto, I think we're doing that. It's hard to know for sure without being in the locker room, but everything you see out of the team it seems like they were having fun and doing it the right way. And you had guys like Christian Rodriguez, John Ryberg, and Ryan James. Um, some of those guys are veterans who are getting even better, like Ryberg is an MLR perennial top try scorer, right, since the inception of the league. And he's getting better because he's playing with those guys. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan James is a young wing coming on the scene, and he's already hitting you know, the highest level of performance and competition available in rugby in the United States because he's being pulled up by those guys. He was in the final, you know? Um, so 
I think that what's important is the level that they're bringing the competition up to. And I think without the shots that LA fired across the bow of the league in the first few weeks, I don't think we would have seen as good a rugby across the board. They let teams know that they had to really elevate the game if they were going to compete. And some teams weren't able to do that and weren't able to compete, but most were. And LA ended up dropping four games over the course of the season. They weren't unbeatable. Um, you know, they didn't put together a dreadnought that nobody could touch as it kind of looked at first. Yeah. People found ways to beat them and they beat them and they ended up winning the final. Um, but they won, I think, that game by having a good game plan and being really composed and not because of some clut of imported talent. I do agree with what you said about the foreign player slots being traded. I think we'll see that reined in. And I think behind closed doors, ownership will probably talk about player payment and you know the structures thereof. But I think overall, it's been good for the league. And I, I think that, um, you know, it's not surprising they were successful in doing what they did. They had a model to bring in veterans mm-hmm. who could get a really good game plan, a really clear game plan running from the first week. And then they did and they ran with it. All right. So, uh, some fair points there, Chris. We've got uh, seven minutes left because I haven't upgraded a, po- a pro on this bad boy yet. So uh, go right ahead. It's right at the seven minute mark. I'm going to try to be done by <laughs> soon. Anyways, here's what I got. The If you look, I've only been playing rugby and I've only been involved in rugby since 2005, but I've paid attention, uh, especially like to all this stuff, age grade through to USA Eagles. Um, the best players that we've had that are Eagles and some of the best Eagles, almost none of them stayed domestic because they did not have an outlet to play domestic professionally. I won't name drop, but there's a certain individual and he has a couple of caps and I know him and he, you know, his life took a turn and for medical reasons, he didn't, you know, did not pursue rugby anymore. But this individual, I remember he got, it got pretty raw. He was like, I was torn because I literally pretty much had to sacrifice the life that I had now to go pursue a professional contract overseas in Europe. And I think that that turns a lot of guys off. It's like, you know, I'm just going to take my business job and I'm going to go apply my trade at Nyack or Old Blue or insert, you know, club team that was high level here in the U.S. And so the argument to say that there's too much foreign players, I mean, listen, if there's no Americans and we're not giving them the outlet to develop, then yeah, I think it's a problem. But I think that there are enough Americans across the league. And look at our own team. You know, there were guys that were developing and they were specifically understudies. How many guys did we see when you look at a DJ Coyle rugby? He's like, this person was signed to the Free Jacks. We never even saw him suit up in the 22 or 23 man roster, but that's a person like a, like a, a kid. I'm a Plymouth State rugby alumni and um, one of our rugby alumni got picked up. He never made it onto the field, but his rugby elevated. And so that's going to be the same for everybody. And now they can stay right here at home in the United States and they can apply it all over the country. Like unlike the Canadians who currently only have a team on the East Coast, what about those West Coast Canadians, you know? So I think that overall, I would like to see more Americans in the league who wouldn't, but I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a positive because they're either going to play here or they're going to play there. And you're going to shut some doors if, hey, I, I don't want to go live in Europe. So that's all I got. I did pretty good. Just over two minutes. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, some good points there for sure. What we might have to do, Dave, is um, get out of here, go back in and, and get the, um, the report card going. So, um, um I, I think I could, I think I can do it in, uh, really? All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be more, I'll be more brief this time. Here we go. Um, go yeah. Me. So I, I graded the team in four areas, attack, defense, game management, and kicking once again, um, attack broke down a set piece, attack and play counterattack, and continuity, their ability to retain the ball. Um, this actually kind of weirdly ended up being the lowest score all above three, which is with level with the competition. Um, the highest were our set piece and counterattack. Um, attacking phase play and continuity could be better, but it all rounded out to 3.4. Defense set piece was a 3.2. Phase play, 3.9. I think we saw really good, really good pressure there. Um, disruption was 3.8. This is out of four. So, you know, four is the highest score possible. And our scramble defense, 3.7. And average to 3.65. Um, pretty good. Game management, really excellent. Toughness was a four. 
roster 3.8, discipline 3.5. We brought that up a lot in the latter half of the season. Game management was a 3.8 for a 3.775 total. Fielding of our kicking was 3.7 points, 3.9. Strategic kicks were, well, they were perfect. They were four. <laughs> and restart kicks were a 3.3. So 3.725 that averages to. All told, if you turn it into a letter grade uh, by averaging it, multiplying by 25, you get 90.9. 91%, it's an A. The team did great. There are a few areas where they could improve. You know, it, there's always going to be things that you can get better at. But overall, uh, the team performed really well. I think especially around our game management, um, which I rated highest of all the categories, um, our, our kicking was really good and our defense was really good. Uh, we, in a lot of ways, are a weird team that didn't use our attack that much. So some of that is just that we like to kick it, we like to pressure on defense, we like to counterattack, we like to hit from set pieces and then and then get it moving and challenge all the different areas of the team's game. So that's that was our game plan. It was a good game plan and our game plan score is really high. Wow. I'm impressed, Dave. You got that done really quick. I was, I, I'm, I'm really surprised. I know that, they, <laughs> that, you know, I, listen, I know you're a detailed guy. Um, I'm really over the moon that you, you nailed that. You nailed it. But what we'll <laughs> Thanks. Do, it's very, yeah. it's very arbitrary, but um, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. I'm sure the players will appreciate the grade that you've provided here as the overall score. Um, yeah. What we'll do is we'll make a graphic on this and some other things too, with this content uh, to try to keep things a little bit more active on social media for the next couple of weeks. So guys, I appreciate you. Obviously we missed Ted in this, but uh, outriders let's mount up. Let's ride. We're going into 2022 um, soon. So yeah. Um, huzzah. Huzzah. Oh, I have one thing. It'll be fast. I have to brag for people. I forgot to do this with TK, but I won the Pawasa Wakanabao nice, uh, cancer charity jersey from the cool. Toronto game. Very happy, thrilled to have it. Going to put it up in my house. It's beautiful. The pink Free Jacks logo is amazing. Nice. So, sorry. Wanted, to, wanted right. to make sure that got in there. I'd, I'd never remember to. No problem. We'll do, uh, we'll do a second goodbye here. So one word, three, two, one. Huzzah! Huzzah! Rangers, what did you think of the very last segment of the Outriders for 2021? Send us an email at jacksrangershow at gmail.com. We love all of your feedback on social media, so please post it after you see or listen to the show. Just one more quick word about telling a friend. So let somebody know that the podcast exists and, you know, what we might do for these many, many months of the off season. From time to time, I might post uh, the video interviews from YouTube of the interviews that we've had throughout the season, like Mags and Dallin and Tammy and all the other folks that we've had on the show, the Eagle, of course. Yeah, I think that would be fun to do just to kind of get those views up and, and keep people engaged in the in the Free Jacks and here in the off season. So I think that would be fun to do. So be on the lookout for those in the future on YouTube. I will post those all over social media as we get those going. But yeah, um, if you haven't done this throughout the season what however you're listening to this go rate five stars subscribe and review so give us a good review we would appreciate it very much if you don't like the show just keep it to yourself <laughs> please don't put any bad reviews on here but yeah it, it's the end of the 2021 season of season one here at the jacks rangers show just looking back it's been awesome i actually recently listened to the first episode just randomly i was like oh, let me go back and listen to the first episode and i think we've come we've come pretty far since then, you know, in terms of getting everything ironed out and, and making sure that it's polished up for the show here. So final interview of the 2021 season is with Tom Kindly. He is the performance director of the Free Jacks. So, so his job kind of mirrors what it would be like as a general manager and other sports. So we talk about that a little bit. Obviously, the MLR draft is next week. So we get in that a little bit with Tom. Very nice guy. I would see him at games and he would always say he loves the show, really appreciates the content that we're doing here at the Jacks Ranger Show. And I just thought that was so nice that you know he, he's a fan of the show and we're a fan of him and his job and of course the free jacks organization so a lot of love going around here guys we really enjoyed tk's time as we like to call him and, and others do too so i'll stop talking and let you listen to the interview with dave and i that we did with our boy tk big fan of the show Woo! 
Huzzah, Rangers. This is Phil Harris again here at the Jacks Rangers show. I've got uh, Dave, of course, the co-host of the Jacks Rangers, well, the Outrider segment. And also we have Tom Kindly, who is the performance director of the Free Jacks. I've got a beer here. This is the Elvish Juice. What do you got, Tom? Uh, I was just telling um, the, the leader of the show here, Phil, that I'm running a boring old Corona, unfortunately, Dave, but it'll do. That'll do. That. Hey, you know, any port in a storm. All right. Crack that bad boy open. Okay. So plug your social media if you would like, TK. And what is your official title with the Free Jacks? Yeah. Um, so I believe it's Tom.Kindly on Instagram and then Tom Kindly on Twitter. Um, my official job title is uh, performance manager. So sort of a hybrid between a lot of general manager and team manager responsibilities um, in the 2020 season was me. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Dave, you got a follow up on that? Yeah. I was hoping that for some of the American fans who aren't familiar with it, including myself, you could clarify. I know it's not exactly your uh, position, but a lot of teams have both a head coach and a director of rugby. And can you talk about that relationship a little bit? Like what the difference is? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. From uh, so, yeah, director of rugby, you know, typically that's the person within the organization that's sort of coordinating the, the contracting process, um, working hand in hand with the coaching staff to on things like player recruitment, player attainment working on a vision where they want their team to go, um, working out the nuts and bolts around the organization and really taking off the, the load from the, the coaching staff so that, that they're not bogged down and, you know, talking to agents on the phone for endless hours and um, coming to agreements with players and helping them with their housing and stuff like that. Although uh, at, at the moment with where we're at, I did, unfortunately for Ryan, um, enlist him into a lot of our, a lot of that stuff with, um, I had him lugging couches up hallways. I had him doing all sorts of stuff that, you know, in a lot of places, a lot of people in credit to Ryan would, would have turned around and said, mate, this isn't my job, but no, that's not Ryan's. So um, I was lucky to have someone that we had a pretty seamless relationship. Um, this year, he called it the one-two combo where we'd identify a player. Um, I'd go in, I'd talk about all the money and stuff like that and take care of that stuff. And then Ryan would come in and talk about the rugby and it'd be a done deal. I think we had like a 95% hit rate. So that's essentially the, the relationship. And for me, it's, it's essentially a different name for a director of rugby. But I mean, for all intents and purposes, that's my role with the Free Jacks. Gotcha. Excellent. Awesome. Great. So um, just to kind of get into your backstory a little bit, where are you from? Yeah, um, so I'm from Dunedin, a little place called Dunedin uh, in, in New Zealand, down the bottom of the South Island, um, where a couple of our players um, have have um, come from as well. And obviously Ryan was born and raised in Dunedin too. So yeah, um, my family are all still living there uh, in Dunedin. We've had a cool link with Otago, and obviously that's where the Highlanders are from and within the Super Rugby competition and, um, and, and the Free Jacks. So I think everyone there... Just about everyone in that city probably knows who the Free Jacks are by now. That's nice. Actually. Perfect. That's great. Yeah. I love that we're international now. That's great <laughs> with the fans. Um, let's see here. How did you find rugby? Uh, what is your origin story with rugby? Yeah, so um, I found rugby uh, obviously at ho back home. And my, my dad played a number of games for one of the, the premier club teams there called Southern Rugby Club. And my uncle, he, he played a lot of games and coached there and was a bit of a, a cult figure in that organisation. And then my grandfather was a life member there as well. So it was kind of ran in the family. Um, and sadly for me, I got kind of the runt genes of the family. And um, I, I played played a, a fair bit growing up. Um, I, I think I have the record for we have a, had a weight. So it was a win and weight, uh, like a weight ranking. So there's under 38 kgs, which is probably like, 80 pounds under 48 kgs which could be 110 and then under 65 kgs and i was in the, the lowest weight tier for four years which is probably still the record <laughs> i played with both my brothers uh in that team uh, i think i went from like uh, being a winger to a prop across four years um <laughs> but yeah no so it was always you know i've got a lot of friends that that went on to play professionally in the region for the highlanders and for otago and it was always you know part of part of my life growing up so yeah, definitely, you know, have always loved loved the sport. 
Very cool. Very cool. So um, what does a day in the life of TK, the performance director of the Free Jacks look like? Just your typical day in season. Yeah. Yeah. So in season, uh, we get up nice and early uh, typically um, and we'll get in um, usually be Ryan and myself and a couple other staff members. We go to the gym at sort of 6 a.m. Um, and then we uh, fly through the shower, get it, get the coffee on, and then get into kind of like our emails and, and different bits and pieces, maybe planning for the weekend um, ahead or the weekend after that, the, the upcoming trips and making sure we had our logistics sorted. Um, and then we'd have a staff meeting about 8 a.m. Um, and then for me, uh, the two hour period after our staff meeting, we've got treatments happening. We've got Ryan's working on his presentations for the day or the next day and the, the session plans. Um, I would be planning, just working on our logistics, working on planning, making sure that the week's going to run smoothly and working on my, my um, presentations for the meeting. Then we'd have a team meeting at 1030 um, and usually I'd present first at that and then our coaching staff would present. Um, and then we'd be into units and um, uh, so like a, you know, positional sessions, um, skills and, and S and C, strength and conditioning. Uh, and the weight room would usually split forwards, backs, they'd flip flop. And it, that'd take us to about lunchtime. Then that'd be me making sure that lunch is there for the boys. Um, and we pride ourselves on being a team that, you know, we do everything in our power to give our players the best possible experience uh, off the field, make sure they're looked after, ready to perform on the weekend. Um, and then after lunch, we head down to the training field. Um, depending on the day, it might be a it might be a light walkthrough session. It might be a more intense um, session on the field. And then after that, um, that's our day. And then we typically get back and then start planning for the next day. So, yeah, pretty pretty full on in season. But um, yeah, we we got into a really nice swing of it this year as a as a staffing group. Perfect, uh, Dave. You got a follow up? Uh, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good groove. I'm sure you guys were working hard, but uh, getting a lot done. Um, now that we're in the off season, how is that different? Uh, obviously, you're not in season, so the structure is very different. But um, are you completely shifting your focus to like player acquisition and signings and things? Or is there a lot of other stuff that fans wouldn't know about that's going on right now? Yeah, yeah. So it's just I've been talking to a few people about it recently. But yeah, essentially there's, there's this year in particular because we've got a shortened off season because the the previous season was delayed a month and then we're back to a normal. If you guys, you'll probably be aware, but we're kicking off February 6th, which is a month earlier, heading into 2022. So it's really only like a four month off season. And um, obviously this year we had uh, coaches to employ. We wanted to build off the good work been done this year you know we kind of know the rest of it with, with a Ryan Martin and we wanted to make sure we, we built off that so we had a really busy two weeks just being making sure we actually just uh, agreed to terms with the incoming head coach for 2022 which is really exciting and working on the assistant coaching staff around that so yeah watch the space I can't reveal the name quite yet but um <laughs> I can't wait I'm so I'm so excited I'm so excited yeah so we we that was obviously a very um you know critical process for us and the most important one and then obviously player retainment um is the the next step and then something that we made sure to do correctly with players as they were exiting the environment we wanted to give them as much clarity as we could um bearing in mind we had a new coach and staff coming in and but obviously we've got a great playing group and the core of those are going to be returning for 2022 and beyond mm -hmm. um and then obviously we're moving down to Quincy. So that means uh, ideally we're going to be in a new facility down there with the, our own gym space, our own just sort of upgrading really. Like that's what we've been trying to do since our inception. Um, and yeah, and then obviously player housing um, and then working with the, the likes of the businesses down there. We need a new lunch vendor, for example. Um, all of the businesses down there that can potentially, you know, we can work with and, and um, help each other out and, um, begin to immerse, immerse ourselves into that space and um, and then once we kind of nail all well, those things we can get back into like our academy system and, and then building the rugby into 2022 so yeah I guess for me that's what and then we've got the draft as well obviously which we're going to talk about but yeah, yeah and then, uh, for example last weekend we just went down to the rugby showcase in Connecticut which was a great event having a look at some of the collegiate talent coming through and yeah, so it's certainly certainly been busy, um, but I mean, I'm very grateful to do something which I love to do like this. So I've yeah, been loving it. Yeah, it sounds like it's busy, but I'm sure it doesn't feel like working because you're, you know, it's it's rugby. It's it's a passion, right? 
no that's that's right you wake up in the morning and like you're like excited to to nail the different tasks that you've got on the to-do list so absolutely yeah you, you did right yeah um so you know for the fo- folks that might have been like tuned out for a second he did mention that we do have we have a head coach um <laughs> that is signed on here obviously you're not gonna give that away on the show i completely understand that but when should we anticipate an announcement um, yeah, so uh, the the incoming head coach, he does have a current um, responsibilities that we're just going to be respectful of. So it'll be that timeline will be dependent on when um, his current employer has sort of it will allow him to make that announcement. Um, okay. But, you know, as soon as we're able to, uh, we're going to pull trigger, but he's in place and already doing some work behind the scenes as of really yesterday. So, um, yeah, no, we're... we're as I touched on, we, we just felt like Ryan did a fantastic job. You know, we had a really strenuous process to make sure that Ryan was the right fit. And then we're, we're really, um, you know, confident that this, uh, the success of the Ryan is going to be, you know, um, you know, just as good, if not better. So, yeah, really proud of that. That's great to hear. It was big <laughs> shoes to fill. So, yeah, for sure. Your, yeah. your vote of confidence means a lot. No, they yeah. certainly do. Big votes. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, the MLR drafts will be held on Thursday, August the nineteenth. Obviously, the 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 theme around this episode, not you know, there's speculation obviously about who could come in potentially. That's why I'm calling it silly season this particular episode. But I believe there's over 100 players currently declared for the draft. Talk about how the team is evaluating these players. You touched on a little bit with the uh, the situation in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think there was something like 300 um, entered into the collegiate draft last year. I believe this year it's getting towards sort of like 150 or more now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, a good pool of players to pick from. Obviously, a little bit COVID hampered this year due to the fact that yeah, there wasn't as much rugby to be played this, this previous season. But um, I think there were a lot more uh, sort of critical and strenuous with the eligibility process, making sure that anyone entering was eligible this year. So uh, I know the credit to the MLR, they've done a lot of work to make sure that that's really clean. Um, but yeah, so I mean, you start by going down every single name, uh, finding out about the player, watching the film. Um, and obviously the film ranges a lot in between the schools and where they're at and the, the standard of rugby they play. Um, but you want to make sure you're doing um, every player the service of, you know, checking their profile out and, and make, checking if they're maybe a, a diamond in the rough um and then then i think that the key area for me is um your contacts and your relationships so i've been over here for six years now and i've been doing my best to make sure i kind of um understand the lay of the land and um have made good key relationships across the collegiate game and sort of calling obviously some of the coaches of the bigger schools and finding out who's worth keeping an eye on and they can usually give you a really good idea of, of the key players that kind of have your eye on heading into, you know, and, and that's how we obviously were able to find out about the likes of Justin Johnson and even Spencer Kruger last year. And then then you really start to narrow it down and, and then you just groom it again and again and then you get to a point where, you know, you've got a ranking really of like 35 players in order of, of the way that you want to go about it, depending on, you know, if you've got positional needs and stuff. But for us, as I said to a lot of the collegiate players, um, down in Connecticut, as you mentioned, the rugby showcase, which was, uh, I think there were 72 athletes who wanted to be to be seen by MLR coaches. There were six teams there um, with eyes on these players. So amazing opportunity for these players that hadn't happened before to be, you know, to be seen and to have a, to have a shot. And, and yeah, so what, what we said to them is like, you know, if there's a, a, the right fit for us in terms of a player and a person, then, you know, we can build our squad around the good domestic collegiate players, you know, not the other way around. We're not looking for a, someone to fill a specific hole. We're looking for the right fit to come into our environment and grow and develop as we've seen with Justin and Spencer. So, yeah, I mean, that that's the process really in a nutshell. Very nice. That's cool. um, what is the team looking for for these two picks that the Free Jacks have? And what, um, you know, maybe not specific positions because I don't want to give anyway any strategy, of course, but prior to the draft, but just overall. Yeah. Yeah, no, great question. So, like, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, you want to have someone that wants to come to Boston. So, like, once you work out the talented players that, you know, are in, in your scope, you want to make sure you're calling each and every one of them and saying, hey, look, we're interested in yeah, Is this a place you'd like to be? Because that's the most important thing. You want to make sure that they come here, they're enjoying life. This is something they want to be. They're comfortable. They've got a good support network. They're going to slot in with our players. Um, 
And then in terms of watching their film beyond, you know, like if they're a, if they're a, a lock, are they a good set piece operator? Are they, can they perform the, the core roles and do they have a good skill set? But I guess beyond that, uh, what's their ceiling like as a player, like physically, you know, what, what do they look like? Um, and then in terms of their behaviours and efforts when you're watching their film, do they do the things off the ball um, that matter? Like, you know, Justin Johnson certainly does, and same with the Spencer Kruger. Are they players that, you know, are, do their references go to bat for them? And, you know, once you start getting serious about the four or five that you're, you're most keen about and you've worked out maybe the teams above you, you think they're going to take that player and that player, you can begin to sort of refine it and, and call a few references and make sure that, you know, that, there aren't any any holes that you don't know about and and their um, abilities or um, what they're like off the field. Very nice. All right. Uh, last one for me here, and then we'll let Dave take over with the questions. Uh, did want to mention to all of the visual um, the folks that are going to be watching this video, we're wearing the same shirt, Tom and I. So uh, yeah, looks looks great. So go ahead. Get, was that uh, shop.freejacks.com? You can get yours. All right. Um, there is an, uh, is there any update that you can provide about the, oh, well, we've already gone over this. So, um, so what is the team looking for without giving too much information away for the head coach? I know that there's a, a guy that has been signed and, you know, we got, we're waiting on that announcement, but what are, what were you guys looking for? Yeah, no, good, good question. So, um, yeah, like we're going to be bringing in two coaches, two full-time coaches this year and supplementing around that. And this will be the first time that we've done that. Um, obviously, um, the year two years ago, we had uh, two part-time coaches. And this this year, just being we had a full-time and a couple of a part-time and a couple of volunteers built around that. And we're stepping it up again. And, and this time, we, we're bringing in two full-time coaches and going to build around that. So it'll be the most professional we've been. So in terms of areas of the game, um, we're going to be able to satisfy those throughout those coaches. So it didn't really matter if the head coach was, say, a, a set piece and D coach or a attack and backs coach or some combination of that. Um, it, it didn't really matter what that was. It was more that, um, you know, we, we place a lot of value in, in the person being a really good educator. Like you've got to be able to coach people across all aspects of the game. You need to be able to coach Justin Johnson coming out of the collegiate game um, and at the same time, you need to be making sure someone like Petty Anson, who's played 16 games for the Lions and Super Rugby, is getting better. And that's something we talk about is they need to be coaching these guys up and making these guys, making sure those guys are getting better as players. And then, you know, the guys down here, a lot of them are going to come with and maybe one or two won't. And that's fine. You know, they found out that this isn't, isn't for them after a certain period of time, potentially. So, yeah, we, we wanted someone that's an educator. They're, they're going to be able to come in and, and help and grow and, and develop not only our players, but our coaches and our our, our staff and educate. And um, well, with this hire too, we, we wanted to make sure it was someone that was hopefully going to be here for quite a long time. Um, so that was really important to us. And and also, we, we've also always placed a lot of value and I'm giving away some, some kind of uh, clues here, but... You know, we didn't necessarily want it, want someone coming in um, at kind of, you know, late in their career. We wanted someone who's, you know, right at the top of the game right now and come in and, and really bring us the cutting edge of the game um, and take us to, you know, continue to, to build off what we've already done because we're quite proud of, you know, what we're able to put together this year, both the, the leadership group, the, the, the management staff, the ownership group, I think the fan base too and, um, it, made, it made me smile the other day. I was, I was looking at, um, of watching back the Atlanta game. I think Phil, you got onto the screen, and I have other cameras around the ground too. So you're on all those different angles um, <laughs> throughout the the Tour of Drake, Summer Summer Vodre try in particular. And like you know, that, that's what you want. You want people really like proud of the the product. And you know, it doesn't really matter about the results. But they'll they'll get there at the end of the day if you've got the right environment in place. And I think we were beginning to do that this year. So. Awesome. Dave, take it away, my friend. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the fans definitely are proud and, and you guys should be proud too. It was a phenomenal season. Um, so great stuff. Uh, you answered my first question already because your answers are so thorough. So well, well done. Um, can you tell us uh, a little bit, looking back on 2021, um, just tell us a little bit about some of the other coaches and staff in the organization, maybe some shout outs and, and, and props to people. I know there's a lot of hardworking people behind the scenes. Yeah, no, no, great, great question. Really important. So 
Yeah, I'll start with um, our head of medical. So there's a guy, Randy Ash, originally from, from New York, but we won't hold that against him. Um, and um, I think he went to, I'm going to butcher the university, the college he went to, maybe Saratoga potentially. Um, and so, yeah, he, he'd worked in ice hockey previously. He's, he's 26, 27 years of age. Um, he'd worked in ice hockey previously and we, we needed a, a full-time AT hire and uh, Randy came in and learned really quickly, was well liked by the players. Um, and so, yeah, for, for Randy to come in and upscore as quick as he has is a real credit to him. And he's done a great job. He's, he's liked by the, well liked by the playing group. And um, Dave's got the cops sneaking up on him. <laughs> They'll never yeah. catch me. Um, so, yeah, credit to Randy. And I'm looking forward to seeing him continue to grow into being a really good rugby um, AT um, and then alongside that, we had James Willocks, who was um, making the massive trek down from Dartmouth College, obviously head coach of Dartmouth College up there and um, a budding up and coming coach who did really well and um, put in a lot of work to, to make it work for us this, this season and really, um, yeah, went to work for the playing group. So, yeah, James Willocks was our assistant coach this year and he'll be involved in some capacity again moving forward. Um, Jared Collinson, actually probably the only staff member who's been with us right since inception. Um, and yeah, Jared's been doing a fantastic job um, developing his trade, um, learning off the likes of Ryan, learning how to be a world class. You know, that's where he's trying to get to. He's, he's a good s &C, but, you know, he, he's got aspirations of, of wanting to be, a, you know, the best s &C in MLR and, and a world class s &C. Um, so he's been doing a great job and, you know, he's really the glue to our organization as well, because when players go away, you know, all, all that really ties them back to the organization is actually their strength and conditioning programs. So he does a great job holding, holding guys accountable um, and making sure that they're, they're healthy and working hard and that their, their um, biometrics are heading in the direction that they need to and stuff like that. And uh, we also had, I mean, uh, the likes of Kane Bubb, um, who is uh, involved with the Mystic program, who came in and volunteered a lot of his time as a kind of assistant volunteer coach and learned a lot this year. So he's a lot of help with for us. And we had our assistant ATs, uh, Courtney Leahy and Alex Hubelbank, who added a lot, a lot of value around the program as well. So, yeah, and, and that's not to, without mentioning, obviously, the off-field staff. We've got Jordan, Ollie, Tim, obviously Mags running the cover. Um, as CEO and then our awesome ownership group too and we've had the likes of John Bobbitt come in this year um, Dave, we've got uh, Dave Barry as well on top of Eric Anderson and um, the Patriot boys so yeah they're, they're taking us to another level I think you're going to see the Free Jets go to another level next year which is really exciting Excellent, looking forward to it, it's just such a great organization, um, it's really cool to be a fan uh, and be able to have so much confidence in like the office staff, you know, which is an area where fans a lot of the time, rightly or wrongly, you know, they, they don't feel that way. Uh, so it's, it's cool. It's a, it's a good experience to be so, so pleased. Um, are there any players who you can confirm are already from the squad are, are already signed for next year? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, we are just working through that process right now and, um, uh, but yeah, you can, I mean, first and foremost, you, you can expect to see like well upwards of 50% of the squad, more like 70% of the squad retained for 2022. Um, but some notable names that uh, you can anticipate to see return are the likes of um, Eric Diaga for one, um, Captain Josh Larson, um, John Poland, halfback, um, Quentin Newcomer, tight head prop, come loose head prop. So yeah, that's just a, a start of a, a raft of names that you can expect to see sure, back. Sure. Into, uh, Sounds like a really good core. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, what I know, and I know you're, you're in the progress process of working on it. Um, so I guess my question is, what is the kind of the timeline for signings? But it sounds like it's, it's a very active process right now. So it sounds like the timeline is yes. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, as as you'll be aware, like with some, um, like with the visa process, if you want to bring in a new foreign player, like that takes three months. You know, if yeah. you're going well, so yeah, like really, all of our recruitment for the most part, we want to have ninety percent of our recruitment done by, if not end of August, um, 
first or second week and into September. So, yeah, as you mentioned, an active process, one that's obviously a little bit slightly slower um, this year with um, just having to wait that couple of weeks with um, employing a new coach and stuff. But, yeah, like, yeah, we, we're pretty lucky that we had an awesome playing group. They really enjoyed the experience. So, you know, there's not going to be too much change in the, in the playing personnel. Great. Um, do you have a personal highlight um, from the season? Something that really, you know, rang your bell uh, as far as a, a great, great moment, either on the field or, you know, when you guys coming together as a, as a club? Yeah. Um, wow. No, that um, I was definitely at like an emotional end of the year for me. Like, you know, I think if not for a couple of things, uh, going the way they did in certain games like we could have very well been in the playoffs if not for a bonus point here or like a tight loss there um, but I, I guess a moment that stood out for me was probably uh, Harry Barlow's try um, against New York off the grubber from Bodine to, to win that game um, the Austin game also stands out but I think that what Ryan Martin's a pretty like neutral and unemotional unassuming sort of a bloke in the in the coach's box i've been with some some much more animated coaches <laughs> in the boxes before um and ryan got up onto his feet jumped fist pumped um <laughs> as that try was being scored uh to beat new york and like that was a pretty special moment for me to to see a guy who's you know like he's been in some big games before he's been in front of forty thousand people before and um, that meant as much to him as any game he's ever been involved in. So I think for me, he was also my high school teacher, um, believe it or not, at Otago Boys High School. So like that was a pretty special moment to sort of like look at, look around the ground and see all the awesome fan base and, you know, like just take a moment then for sure. That's great. Um, any areas that you are excited to improve on next season? Anything you're targeting where um, you think there's there's a good chance for growth um, and that you're you're looking forward to doing that yeah no absolutely Dave like I think like organizationally for sure um is the the first the first aspect like I, I think we're just making big strides year to year rug, rugby operations wise and, and otherwise just this year we were so fluent in how we traveled we're lucky to have an awesome sponsor in Delta so when we do travel often we're, we're with Delta we get to use the Sky Lounge um, we get, you know, priority boarding. We, we get treated very well. And, like, our travel was just seamless this year. Um, so organisationally, like, we are increasing our professionalism year after year in an a exponential fashion. Um, we've never had an actual set-piece specialist coach. Um, and I think a testament to, how, like, to our players um, for how well the set-piece functioned this year. And also James Willis for facilitating um, that forward group. But for us to be bringing in a, a set-piece specialist, um, to see what, you know, he can conjure with that board pack is, is really exciting. Um, and yeah, I guess for me, mate, probably those, are, and obviously being able to play at veterans as well for a, for a whole season, yeah. hopefully get that place packed rafters. It's going to be um, awesome. It's, it's be, such yeah. a great venue. Yeah. Oh, it is. It was, it was, it was a very cool night um, against Atlanta and um, it's, it's only going to get bigger and better. So. Absolutely. That's uh, that's it for me. Thank you, TK, for your time. This has been really fun. Uh, can't wait for the draft. Uh, maybe we'll do a follow up interview after. <laughs> yeah, TK. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, before we get out of here, I've got one word association for you. I did want to pitch one of our buddies here, one of the original Rangers. He was in the third episode uh, as an interview. Um, his name is Dylan. Uh, his last name is Ferrarci or Ferraci. It's F A R A C I. He is a yep. scrum half. Um, he is uh, declared for the um, MLR draft. Not only is he a good scrum half, but he's also a good graphic designer, social media guy. He's got inter internships all over the place. Um, I think it'd be a great pickup for the Free Jacks. Just, just my personal, you know, <laughs> just wanted to throw that out there. I think he'd be a friend awesome. of the show. Yeah, highly the show. comes highly recommended. The highly Jacks recommended. Rangers seal of approval on Absolutely. Uh, Dylan. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant! No, I, I am aware that Dylan has entered the draft, and we are um, we've been candy watching his film, and yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, very cool, Dylan. I've done my part, so uh, so <laughs> here we go. So one word association. I'm going to say one word or maybe two words, and just give me the first word that pops in your head here. Would oh God, would you? Blue. <laughs> Mags. Eclectic. 
Okay, I agree. Uh, MLR draft. Innovative. Okay, Boston. Boston. Tough. Yep. Uh, Guiltinis. Wow, I'm going to have to send some of myself. <laughs> Australian. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and just for our own little selfish reasons here, Jack's Rangers. Oh, best fans in the comp. Ooh, I like that. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. It's been awesome. Very enlightening. Thank you, TK. Maybe we'll have you on later on. And uh, well, I mean, this is supposed to be the last episode, but as I'm like making it, I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want this to end for four months. So we'll see what happens. All right, guys. Um, yeah, no, maybe you. Yeah. My internet connection is unstable, so if anything was said, I didn't hear it, but hey, have a great <laughs> night. <laughs> we'll Plausible deniability. Yeah. We'll have go. a great night, everybody. Thank Let's you. Ride. Thank you, Tom. Woo! Cheers, guys. Cheers. Appreciate it. Huzzah. Huzzah. All right, Rangers. That'll do it for guest interviews in 2021 here at the Jacks Rangers Show. Season one is pretty much officially over with. We will be back with season two in 2022 prior to kickoff of MLR season what is that, five? Yeah, we're up to five now, I think. Season five, which will be the Free Jack's second full season in MLR. Hoping for a playoff push. I mean, it's very early, super early, too early to say if we'll make the playoffs, but it really, I hope we do. I mean, this is a this is a sports market that does not accept mediocrity and wants championships in the trophy case. So, yeah, it's been a wild ride from the first episode now to episode 14 here in at Silly Season is what we're calling this episode. Appreciate everyone that's been along for the ride here couldn't have done it without you rangers out there that listen in each and every week like i said tell somebody about the podcast in the off season please do watch some videos that i'll put up maybe you haven't seen all the videos that we've did with all of the interviews that we've had throughout the season so check them out like them share them with your friends and we'll get uh, ready to go into 2022 stronger than ever did want to mention that the first regiment which is the supporters group started by doc will be having our first first Zoom meeting on Thursday. So if you're not a member of the First Regiment Supporters Group on Facebook, highly recommend that you go request to join that. It is the first, which is the number one, ST Regiment. It is a private group on Facebook that is 65 members strong at this point. If you're a hardcore Free Jack supporter, we definitely want you a member of the First Regiment, which is a New England Free Jack Supporters Club. Um, it's not just an online thing. We plan on having you know, away trips, meetups, maybe do some karaoke, some mini golf in the off season, you know, get to know each other. I know there's some scarves that we're trying to pre-order right now. So check out the scarf. Let us know if you would like to purchase one of those. And officially, we will have our first meeting on Thursday the 12th. So, you know, join that Facebook group or check the first regiment out on Twitter or Instagram for further information about that. We definitely want to hear you and how you want to form the club. Essentially, this is an organizational meeting. How do you want this supporters group to function going forward? You know, we need everybody's input that's a Free Jacks fan. So it's all inclusive. If you're a Free Jacks fan, you can join the first regiment. You know, looking forward to helping those folks out and working with them closely in this off season. One final American Revolutionary War history. So on this day in 1775, Captain Daniel Morgan and his Virginia riflemen arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts to serve under General George Washington. Revolutionary War, quote, the last one of 2021. Information is the currency of democracy. And that was our boy Thomas Jefferson who said that one. It's been a pleasure doing the show, um, the podcast here in Podcastville, all throughout 2021. Appreciate you guys listening in. This is Phil Harris up here at the Granite Outpost signing off for the very last time here in 2021. I'll see you in 2022. Let's ride. Huzzah. Woo!